There we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Wednesday night Q&A. There we go. Hopefully that's all working now. It says it's live. So if you are hopping on, uh, let me know. Say hi in the comments. Let me know that you're watching. It's always interesting to see who's watching, so make sure you say hi and comment. And I see five people watching so far. So hopefully you've been having a good week so far. And I don't know if you had a good day at work today or whatever you were doing. Uh, let me know. And like I said, you can comment in the comments below. Um, it's always interesting too. Like uh, I know most people uh, are watching from Fort St. John, but uh, it's always interesting. Hello, Maybell, Alan. I don't know if I've ever met you, but um, it's always interesting to see. Sometimes we have people watching from Tumblr Ridge or Hudson Hope. So even if you want to say, hey, I'm watching from wherever, uh, that's always curious to see. It was like, um, you know, we've been live streaming our, our Sunday services for uh, like six months now. And I didn't know this, but on uh, on Vimeo where we live stream, it kind of records where people are watching from. And it was really fascinating that we have people watching our, our um, Sunday morning live stream from every province and territory except PEI and New Brunswick. Those are the two provinces that... Um, Oh, okay. Oh, there we go. So, um, yeah, it's just curious to see uh, where people are watching from. Anyways, oh, Jen Edie's daughter. Okay, yep, I have met you. Um, I just forgot your name. <laughs> so we've got uh, four questions tonight. One, two, three, four. Four questions, unless um, as you're watching, if you have... Uh, more questions that come up or you need clarification. We got some good some good questions tonight. It's going to be fun. Um, one thing too, um, before we dive in, I actually had a really interesting um, email from someone. Uh, they said, you know, they watch the Q&As, but then, then sometimes they want to go back and watch and they find it really hard to like find them on the page. Um, so f starting tomorrow morning, um, every Thursday, we're just going to upload this live Q&A to our YouTube page. So um, it might just be easier to find if you just go to YouTube. And for some reason, if you want to rewatch or you want to, uh, you forget what the answer was to one of the questions or something like that, um, you can just search North Peace MB Church on YouTube and then we'll just post, it'll say, you know, live Q&A September you know, 23rd or whatever, and then you'll be able to find them there. So I thought that was interesting that someone wanted to re-watch and just kind of hear the answer to the question again. So, uh, hi Lisa, thanks for joining us. So we'll uh, we'll get started and just kind of dive into some of these questions here. And uh, like I said, as we go along, if you want to um, weigh in or you have like comments or question, extra questions or something like that. Um, please comment in the comments that that always makes it more fun. Uh, hi, David. Hi, Joni. Thanks for joining us. So the first question is this. Should the day that a person surrenders their life to Jesus be like an anniversary day or birthday or any other important date? I know some people don't remember the day. Does that mean they haven't fully given their life to Jesus? Um, that's a really good question. Hi, Gerald. Are you and Joni watching in different rooms of your house? <laughs> um, so the question, that's a really, that's an interesting question, right? Should, should we all remember, you know, August 4th, 1972 or whatever it is, the day that we surrendered to Jesus? Should we have that cataloged in our brain? Or, um, or or not like does that is that very important and if you don't remember the exact moment does that mean that you haven't really fully given your life to Jesus so I think this this comes from in North America in years past um, which is it you are watching in different rooms that's hilarious um, 
So in years past in North America, there was this kind of heavy emphasis on um, you gotta you gotta say the prayer, right? Say the sinner's prayer. And, and and churches and evangelists and lots of Christians just wanted people to say that prayer, right? Because then you're in. Say the prayer. Like, here, let me lead you through the sinner's prayer. Um, ask Jesus into your heart. And that was really emphasized. Uh, I remember that when I was growing up as a kid. You know, you would go to um, a youth event or a big evangelistic rally. I mean, I went to one of the Billy Graham crusades in Ottawa when I was growing up in Ottawa. And that's kind of what it felt like, right? Okay, everyone, I'm sure you've been to an event like this where it's kind of like, okay, everyone close your eyes, bow your head, right? If you want to ask Jesus into your heart, raise your hand. No looking around. Don't look. No one's watching. Uh, hi, Sheila. Um, no one's watching. Don't look around. Okay, if you want to if you want to ask Jesus into your heart, raise your hand, right? <laughs> and we always make, you know, I see that hand. I see that hand. And then the pastor, the preacher, whatever would be like, okay, repeat after me, you know, dear Jesus, um, please forgive me, I ask you into my heart today. And, and then it was kind of, hey, you're in. A um, couple of things. I, I, there's nothing, like if you did that, I'm not slamming that at all, right? Um, but the, the whole idea of like the sinner's prayer and asking Jesus into your heart, um, it's not really found in the Bible anywhere, uh, which I find really interesting. More and more as I study the Bible, I'm learning that Lots of what we do in church um, or lots of theologies or ideas of w whether it's like what we do or who God is, it's not actually found in the Bible. It's come from like tradition or, you know, human ideas. So the idea of like a sinner's prayer, hey, just say this prayer and then you're in, that's actually not found anywhere in, in the Bible at all. Um, what we're told... You know, if someone wants salvation, I mean, Romans 10 is a really good example of what that would look like. Um, and, I, and this, I think, um, is where we get the idea that, you know, you ask Jesus into your heart. But Paul says this um, in verse 9, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's what Paul says, here's what salvation looks like. You confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. You believe in your heart that Jesus died and was raised from the dead, and you're saved. Right? It's interesting. That's, that's what he sums up as salvation. He says, for with the heart, one believes and is justified, and with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. So I think um, that looks different for different people, right? So for instance, I, have, I don't remember the exact date where I surrendered to Jesus. I have, a, I have kind of like a timeline in my mind, right? I can remember being led through that kind of sinner's prayer, you know, when I was five or six um, and saying, you know, dear Jesus, please forgive me. I'm sorry for all the bad things I do. Please come into my heart. I love you. Amen. Right? I've said something like that when I was five or six. And then I can remember in my grade nine year of high school, so I would have been, you know, 14 or something like that, 13 or 14, um, I remember going to a big, you know, youth conference with our youth group, and I, I don't remember the preacher's name, but I remember a man got up and he preached the gospel, and it was one of those moments when it was kind of like the gospel all of a sudden clicked. It was like, that makes perfect sense, and I want that. I want to, I believe in Jesus. I believe he's Lord. I'm a sinner. I need him. I'm confessing with my mouth. And that was the moment where I really, I think, um, understood what it meant to follow Jesus. Uh, so I don't remember the date, but I don't think that it's not that I, you know, I haven't fully given my life to Jesus. I think it just looks different. God calls different people differently. Um, and more and more, I am being convinced that for many people, salvation is is a, a process, right? I, I think for lots of people, salvation is kind of like a boom, June 8th, 1945, boom, I, I became a Christian. And for lots of people, uh, myself included, who kind of grew up in a Christian environment, right? Grew up, um, my dad was, uh, my parents were missionaries and pastors, 
and I grew up in the church. I grew up in a Christian home, and um, I, 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 I just kind of, for me, it was this slow process as I began to understand things about Jesus and who he is and what the Bible is and what the gospel is, you know, you know, when I was five, was that when? I don't know. I'm not really convinced because at five years old, did I did I really understand what I was saying or doing? Or was I just saying that prayer because my sister did and I wanted to be like her, right? But there was this, there was this process as my understanding of Jesus grew and grew and grew to this moment where then, you know, I was 13 or 14 and I decided I want to actually follow Jesus. Enough with all just the the knowledge in my head about him, he's actually my Lord and Savior and I want to follow him. So I, I think that's one of the cool things about how God works. He calls different people differently. So I'll give you an example. There was a guy um, who, I think he's moved away now, but he was coming to our church uh, and he wasn't a believer, right? He was just curious about who God is and who Jesus is. And so he came to our church, um, I want to say it was at least a year, probably 18 months, and he would come every Sunday, and I would meet with him, and other people in the church would meet with him, and he would ask such good questions, and he was just so hungry for what the Bible said and who Jesus was, and uh, you began to see changes in his life, right? So I, I remember one of our elders went and met with him, and he said, I just have this, he told me, this elder told me, I just have the feeling, I got to ask this guy where he's at, and just kind of say, you know, where are you at with Jesus? So he met with them and he said, hey, can I, can I just ask you some questions? So the guy said, sure. So uh, our, one of our elders said, you know, well, okay, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? And this guy said, yeah, absolutely. Okay, do you believe that he was like a, a, like a real person that, that was born and lived and died and was raised from the dead? Yes, I totally believe that. Okay. Um, do, do you believe that his death and resurrection it is for the like forgiveness of sins? And the guy's like, yes, absolutely. So then our elder was like, listen, I'm not sure, but I think you might be a Christian. And the guy was like, oh. And so for him, he had just been confessing with his mouth and believing in his heart. Yes, to all of these things, not realizing that he was actually surrendering to Jesus because he didn't have anyone who had just walked him through, okay, say this prayer and now boom, you're in. He had just, as he heard the gospel, he just said, yeah, I believe that. Yep, I believe that. Yes, I believe that I'm a sinner. Yep, I believe that I need forgiveness. And, and yet he hadn't realized in his own mind that, yeah, buddy, I think you're actually a Christian. And, and for him, it was like, oh, I think you're right. And so that those kind of stories are so interesting that God saves people differently. So uh, whoever asked this question, if, if you're like worried that I don't remember the, the exact date, that doesn't mean that you haven't fully given your life to Jesus. God calls different people differently. Uh, I know lots of people that they know the exact date that they surrender to Jesus. And lots of people are like me that, you know, I know the general time frame, right? Somewhere in my grade nine year, that's when I, I made a commitment to Jesus. But I don't think um, if you don't know the exact date, you're not actually a Christian. Um, I think it just shows you how unique God is and that he calls different people differently. So anyways, I'd love to hear in the comments too. Uh, maybe maybe answer this question in the comments. For you, was it a, I know the exact date? Or for you, was it maybe a gradual process? I'm always curious to hear. So if you're if you're comfortable sharing, you know, if you're a, a, a Christian and you're watching, what was it like for you? Do you know, like, you know, January 8th, 1996, that's when I mean, do you know, or is it more like a general timeline? Comment and let me know. That's always interesting to hear. Uh, okay, so we'll move on to the next question um, as you kind of comment or give feedback or what you think about that as well. Uh, this person said, can you look at 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 to 17, and just clarify um, how this looks for us to share Jesus with others. I was just reading this this morning, and my thought came, 
to where there's people that think we should not be associated with unbelievers at all. So that's why I have this question. Um, oh, so we'll just say, so Debbie says, I know the month and the year, and Joni says, a gradual process. Very much the same as your story with the gentleman. Cool. So second, let's just read this passage then. Second Corinthians 6, uh, 14 to 17 says, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what, um, what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Um, so that's what the passage is. Oh, I mean, I feel like I got to press pause now because everyone's commenting. I guess there's a slight delay. So I ask the question and then I move on and then everyone comments. So Lisa says, I have a general timeline. I know the year, but not the month or the day. David says somewhere between Halloween of 1988 and Christmas of 1988. That's pretty good. That's like a two month span there. Uh, Maybell says, for me, it was a gradual process. And just now this year being 14, I feel much closer to God. Um, Sheila says, month and year, forgot the date. Uh, I have it written in my first Bible, a new King James. Cool. See, it's so, it's so awesome. Share your stories with people. because It's so encouraging how God saves people. It's so, it, it never gets old. So um, basically, this passage in 2 Corinthians 6 says, um, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And so this person is asking, okay, what does that actually mean, right? Um, how does this look? Okay, so if we're not supposed to be unequally yoked with unbelievers, and yet we're supposed to share the gospel with them, and like, how do we have relationship with them to share the gospel if we can't be yoked with them? And first of all, we should even back up. What the heck does unequally yoked mean? Um, and why? So, um, oh, Gerald knows the date, October 10th, 1980. Hey, I wasn't even born yet, Gerald. Um, so... <laughs> Um, so uh, being unequally yoked, the idea of a yoke, right, is, um, it would, it was like a bar that would, uh, um, kind of keep two animals together, right? So if you had two oxen, um, um, and then you would put a bar across and then they would be kind of yoked together. So they would, they couldn't, you know, you couldn't have an oxen just kind of wander off. They're, they're tied together and being un, sorry, I can hear my cat clawing at the door, being unequally yoked. Uh, would be when when a farmer, you know, for whatever reason, tied a strong ox to a weak ox, and then basically what would happen is if a farmer ever did that, um, and they were unequally yoked, well then the strong ox would be would be pulling harder, and then you would basically just be going in a circle, right? You wanna you wanna be equally yoked so that the ox pull at the same time, and then you can plow your field or whatever. So. Being unequally yoked, it's this farming metaphor uh, for, um, oh, there's my cat coming in. Sorry. Uh, give me one second. I got to throw my cat in the garage. My cat can actually open the garage door, so... Um, um, so yeah, that's, um, hey, Lorianne, um, that's what unequally yoked means, right? You have two oxen that are, are not the same strength, and then you just kind of get pulled around in circles. So Paul uses that example, um, and he says, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And then he uses a whole bunch of examples, right? What partnership does righteousness have with lawlessness? Fellowship, uh, does light have with darkness? Christ with Belial, which is Satan. Um, what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement does the temple of God have with idols? So he gives these contrasts, right? You know, light, darkness, they're opposites. Um, righteousness, lawlessness, opposites. Jesus, Satan, opposites, essentially. So um, uh, Paul is saying, you, as a believer, you shouldn't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever, right? So my thought um, is that Jesus or Paul Paul is not telling us that we can't have any kind of relationship with unbelievers. Um, 
because we're told, right, to go and make disciples. Well, you can't really make disciples. You can't, you can't tell people about Jesus if you don't know them, right? You can't be like, hey, I care about you and I want you to know about Jesus, but stay away from me. Like you can't, <laughs> it doesn't work like that. So that's not what Paul's getting at. I think what Paul is, um, is getting at is when you are so, um, so intertwined with unbelievers, like you're hitched together, literally, right? That's, that's the wording that's used. You're, um, you're hitched up, you're yoked together with them. So it's, it's an image of being allied or even you would be identified with, with unbelievers. Um, so I think it, it, it can apply to a couple different scenarios. Um, uh, so, so Cassie gave her thought. She said, my personal thought on that passage is that we should not be unequally, unequally yoked in close or intimate relationships with non-Christians. Our spouse and our closest, most trusted friends should be believers. I don't think it means that we should shun or avoid anyone who doesn't believe in Christ. So I guess the people we do life with should be Christians. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Um, so for instance, you know, you think about the mo the closest, uh, intimate human relationship you have, right? Is husband and wife. So I believe that Paul would say a believer should not marry an unbeliever because then you would be unequally yoked because you think about the decisions you make about worship and finance and kids. Unbelievers have different priorities than believers do, right? And so you're going to be unequally yoked and kind of spinning in circles if you if you uh, marry an unbeliever. So even so, here's an example, right? If a uh, you know we've done 15 weddings or so in the past couple of years, um, and so far it's been either two believers getting married or two unbelievers getting married. But if so, for instance, if a young a young adult from our church came and said, "Hey, I got engaged, and here's my fiance." and he's not a Christian at all, and I'm claiming to be a Christian, I would say, well, I can't actually marry you um, because I believe that you shouldn't be in that close of an intimate relationship with someone who doesn't share your faith. Um, some people have said that this refers maybe to, to um, really close business relationships. So if I'm going to go into business with someone, you know, maybe Paul is saying you shouldn't go into business with unbelievers because, again, you think about... Um, not to say that, you know, anyone who's an unbeliever has terrible business practices. That's not what I'm saying. But there's decisions that will be made that maybe you as a believer would disagree with. And so Paul would say, well, don't be yoked up with someone like that, right? Um, so I think it's referring, like Cassie said, to, to just really close, intimate relationships. Paul says, um, those should be believers. Your closest intimate relationships should be those who share your faith and can kind of um, spur you on and encourage you to, to follow after Jesus. Um, because, and, and this is what, I can't, I can't remember if it was my, um, my grandma or my mom that told me this, but she said, the, the downward pull is always stronger than the upward pull. And so what she meant by that was like, if you are, if you're closest human relationship is an unbeliever. Um, again, not to say that they're all like wicked and evil and want the worst for you. That's not what I'm saying. But it's much easier to be pulled downward into maybe sin or compromise or, or things like that than you to just kind of pull um, someone up to your way of living. Um, Susan said, being in a relationship with an unbeliever is nothing fun about it. Very, very two different views in life. Yeah, that's true. So let me give you an example from my youth ministry days. I was a youth pastor for almost nine years, and I would, I would often have, you know, 17, 18-year-olds um, who would say, ah, I've got a girlfriend now, or i got a boyfriend now. And it, it would be someone from our youth group who was a believer, wanting to follow Jesus, and they would go, yeah, my boyfriend and girlfriend's not a Christian, but it's okay, right? It's, they're not going to, you know, I'm, I'm still going to love Jesus and I'm still going to follow them. They're not going to change my mind. And I would say probably, if not 100% of the time, 90% of the time, that person ended up not wanting to follow Jesus anymore because of the, the pull of that close relationship. 
And uh, their unbelieving boyfriend or girlfriend would be like, why are you going to youth group? Why are you going to church? Why are you reading your Bible? Why are you praying? Why is that so important? That's so silly. And they would go, oh, okay, yeah, I guess you're right. And inevitably that would happen, right? But they would always say, nah, it's not going to happen to me, right? I'm a strong Christian and I can, I can kind of yoke my, they won't use that language, but I can yoke myself to an unbeliever. Nothing bad's going to happen. And inevitably it always turned out poorly. So I think the Bible is so right here, right? Um, we as believers, and it's not a pride thing because we can't do it without Jesus, but we're called to be set apart. Jesus says, I want you to be different than everybody else. And so if your goal as a Christian is, I want to be a Christian, but I want to fit in with everybody else who lives in the world, well, that's not going to work out very well for you. So I think we still can have relationships with non-believers. Absolutely, we should have relationship with, relationships with, with non-believers because we want to tell them about Jesus. And, and not even that, not as a project, but we should just love people, right? But I think um, what Paul is getting at is that the, the most important relationships in your life, um, your spouse, you know, your best friend, like those people that you're doing life with, um, they should help you in your walk with Jesus and not pull you back. So anyways, that's a really good question. Uh, and kind of a one that you, it's just, this is real life. You got to figure out what that looks like, right? In your relationships with people. So uh, Susan says, in my opinion, hanging out with unbelievers can sometimes lead you astray. Yeah, that's true. Right? Um, so for instance, I, uh, there's a, a um, I guess it also depends on the person, right? Because there, there's a, uh, uh, some Christians that I know, friends of mine, and he used to be massive into the party scene and drugs and alcohol. And when he became a Christian, he had to like cut it off, right? I'm not, you know, I'm cutting all of these friends out of my life now. I can't do it anymore. Can't be around it. I'm different now. But I have another friend who it was the opposite. He used to smoke pot and hang out with his friends. And then he became a believer and he said, this is so real to me. I have to tell my lost friends about that. And so he would go and hang out with them and he wouldn't do drugs and he wouldn't, right? He would, he would, and everyone said, why are you so different? Well, it's because of what Jesus has done and he was able to share the gospel. So I think it also depends on, on personality and some people um, can do that and some people can't. So anyways, let's move on to the next question. That was a great, uh, great question. Uh, this question I get a lot. Ready? I find Revelation difficult to understand. Join the club. <laughs> um, lots of people are commenting that we're seeing the book of Revelation being lived out currently in some ways. That this ID uh, 2021, chipping our hand as new ID or the vaccine proof, etc. is the mark of the beast. Can you please offer some biblical insight and clarification on this? Thank you. And then this person said, thank you for an awesome, applicable kick-butt sermon <laughs> yesterday. That's the first time any of my sermons have been called kick-butt, but that's great. So, the book of Revelation is difficult to understand. I think it's because we sometimes make it more difficult than it's supposed to be, and we read it how it's not meant to be read. Um... But I agree. Here's why it's confusing. So many people are commenting, oh, you know, this new chip ID or this vaccine thing is the mark of the beast. And just, just as a fun trivia, do you remember when like cell phones and the chips that are in them were considered the mark of the beast? And do you remember when credit cards had chips in them and everyone freaked out that it was the mark of the beast? So this is not new, right? Anytime any kind of new technology comes out, I, I'll be nice, but Christians, I was going to say crazy Christians, um, freak out and say, ah, don't do it, it's the mark of the beast, and then give it time, and it's like, oh, okay, it's not that at all. So this is not new, right? This idea of a chip or like they're tracking us, like anybody with a phone is being tracked. So... Um, but this person is asking, can you clarify? Because you're right. I mean, you have people who are saying, you know, um, you know, this certain thing is this scroll and this certain thing is this, the second bowl in the book of Revelation. Now, here's, 
here's what I would give as, as insight and clarification. Um, the book of Revelation is not a crystal ball. And the book of Revelation is not even a step-by-step -step roadmap of how the end will happen. It's just not. Um, it's not meant to be read that way. It's not the way that it was written. And unfortunately, because of, really if we're honest, the Left Behind books and that whole theology about the rapture and, and the seven-year tribulation, and uh, this and that and that, and the Antichrist and the beast and the mark of the beast and all that stuff. And it's been popularized by the Left Behind books, which are terrible books. They're, they're awful books. Um, we think that the book of Revelation is a step-by-step, -step, this happens, then this happens, then this happens, then this happens, and then Jesus comes back and everybody is happy at the end. The book of Revelation is not meant to be read that way. It is not a step-by-step -step guide about how everything ends. It's not a crystal ball. It's not how you're supposed to read that book. Um, the book of Revelation is uh, apocalyptic literature. And apocalyptic literature is not meant to be read like that. If you read any other apocalyptic literature, it's never meant to be read like that. And the word revelation, it, it literally means like um, an unveiling, basically. So John, the disciple John, he's, he's um, on the island of Patmos. He's been exiled there. And we're told that he has a vision, but literally, like the the wording of it is, it's as if God um, pulled back the curtain and let John see what was going on in the spiritual realm. That's what's happening, right? It's not that John all of a sudden was teleported to 2020 and he saw COVID. That's not what happened, right? That's just that's actually quite arrogant and self-centered to think that the Book of Revelation has everything to do with us, right? So John was not teleported to um, 2020, he didn't see COVID. Um, what happened is, um, is John, the veil was pulled back, right? Because there's a spiritual dimension, right? There's a spiritual realm that you and I normally do not see, right? And so John, this vision that he has, the veil is kind of pulled back and God says, um, there's more than meets the eye, right? What is going on in world history from the ascension of Jesus until his return. Here's what's happening in world history, but, uh, but God kind of pulls the veil back and he says, but look, John, here's what's actually happening in world history. So I don't think that we read it going, none of this has happened yet, right? It's all future. I think that's a terrible way to read the book of Revelation. You shouldn't read it like that. Um, now, it makes it less, um, I don't know, Sexy is the wrong word, but the reason that people glom onto that, it, right, is because it's so exciting and like we can crack the code and this is that and that is that and the, you know, the, the scorpion beasts that come out are Black Hawk helicopters and Gog and Magog or Russia and China and we try and, we try and like crack the code and it seems really exciting when it, it can kind of fit, but um, the book of Revelation is much much richer than that. It's actually a discipleship manual for how Christians go through trial and suffering in any generation, right? Since it was written kind of around 90 AD till now, until Jesus returns. This is a discipleship manual. Um, Cassie says, I know someone who reads Revelation completely literally and would use it as a means to try to terrify people into coming to coming to Christ. He would look for signs everywhere and then tell people Jesus was coming down at any second. So repent. He scared a lot of people. Yeah, oftentimes it's used to um, scare people. So we don't have time to go through like the whole book, right? Um, but it's a lot of imagery and it's a lot of metaphor and it's a lot of um, uh, pictures and, and um, ideas trying to comprehend what's going on spiritually. Um, and, and so the book of Revelation uses um, a, a writing technique called recapitulation, which basically means um, an idea is given, and then the idea is, it's like you almost, um, for lack of a better term, you know, an idea is given, and then it's kind of like you go back and you give the same idea from a different angle, if that makes sense. You're like, 
um, you're summarizing and restating the main point of something. So this is so just really briefly. You know, you read if you just would read straight through the book of Revelation and assume this is all chronological. What you see is seven seals are opened, then you see seven trumpets are blasted, and then you see um, some other stuff happen, first beast, second beast, um, and then seven bowls are poured out. And so lots of people think, well, there's 21 things that happen, right? Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls, and then this last big battle. But actually, the book of Revelation, the way it's written, is that those are those are different viewpoints of the exact same thing, right? So seven seals, it's a viewpoint of, of, of um, God working throughout human history and evil responding to that. And then the book, and this is maybe nerdy technical jargon that you're like, I don't care about this, but it's really interesting. And then the book recapitulates and then it shows us the exact same thing from a different angle of seven trumpets. And here's the exact same thing that's happening. Uh, human history and how people um, hate God and how believers are called to kind of suffer through until the end. And then the book recapitulates. So let's look at it from a different angle. And it talks about the seven bowls of God's wrath. So I think that's actually a really um, faithful way to read the book of Revelation. Not It's not chronological. Um, it jumps around in history and... And, and remember, John is writing to real Christians in um, AD 90. And he's writing this book to them. And they're going through what? Suffering, pain, persecution. And uh, God is reminding his church, hey, you're going to experience this. This is what's going on. Um, and God wins in the end. Be faithful until the end. That's the overwhelming message of Revelation. Be faithful till the end. Be faithful to the end. Jesus is going to win. Be faithful to the end. So I, I think it's really um, sloppy, if I could say that, to try and like read it all literally and chronologically and now we're waiting for some literal antichrist to come, one person, this world figure, and we're waiting for a literal chip in our arms the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast, if you read it, it's just interesting. It's it's a mark, someone who is aligning themselves with Satan. Um, Joni says, so John's using different illustrations in hopes that the people won't understand. Um, I Kind of. See, apocalyptic literature is really interesting because these are visions that John's seeing and he's just writing down what he sees. But I, I think... Yeah, you could say that. You know, here's here's a different vantage point of what I'm trying to communicate to you. So yes, I I would say um, my belief is that yes, John could be, or, or rather, God is showing John different vantage points of the same things throughout human history because it helps us understand. Right? Uh, we're just we're by nature we're like that. Sometimes you need. Um, Sorry, my mind's kind of all over the place. If you would think of a diamond, right? If you lo would look at a diamond straight on, um, it looks a certain way. And yet, if I kind of turn the diamond a little bit, oh, and the light catches it differently from this side, and it looks different, it's the same diamond, right? It's the same object, but how I turn and, and look at it, wow, okay, I never noticed that part before when the light hits it from this way. Oh, and if I hold it kind of up, oh, can you see the the markings underneath? So I think that's what's happening with this vision. John sees a vision of how God works throughout human history and how humanity rebels and nations that hate God, right, represented by Babylon in Revelation 18. And then it's almost like John, you know, God tilts the diamond a bit. That's a bad illustration, but he kind of tilts it a bit. And then John sees the same thing from it. Oh, okay. Okay. It's seven trumpets. Interesting. So I'm going to write down what I see about. So that's, that's my view of the book. Um, and so the mark of the beast is people who, you know, I, I don't think that it's a literal mark because earlier on we're told that God marks his followers, right? The, and we don't have a literal 
mark, right? So why is, you know, the Holy Spirit is our mark. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit. And so that's what that means. But then why do we think, well, the mark of the beast is a literal mark? Well, why is it? And our mark as followers isn't literal. It's the Holy Spirit. So you have to be really careful how you interpret the signs in this book. Um, I think the mark of the beast is anyone who... Um, anyone who who willingly says, I'm going to follow the systems and patterns and structures of the world and of Satan willingly. Um, and it's interesting. It says um, it, um, that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. And that's why people are freaking out about all these things. But did you know, actually, in the time that this was written, there were, in almost every ancient city, there were what were called trade guilds. And so if I was a blacksmith, if I wanted to actually do business, I, have, I had to be a part of a trade guild. And the trade guilds were very closely connected to worship of false gods. So you read, you know, you have to take the mark so that you can buy or sell. Um, and if you don't have the mark, you can't buy or sell. That's the trade guilds. That would be the, the modern day equivalent or that would be, sorry, the ancient equivalent of the Mark of the Beast. Because Christians would go, well, no, I can't join a trade guild. I can't willingly worship something other than Jesus. So now I can't buy or sell. So there you go. There's the Mark of the Beast. They refuse to take the Mark of the Beast, right? So it's just, it kind of, I would encourage you to to wrestle with um, uh, kind of how we were raised and brought up. And wrestle with that, with what the text actually says, and actual world history. It's really fascinating, because I believe that the mark of the beast has been there throughout history. It's not some future final thing that finally we have chips implanted in our arms. Anytime anyone has ever said, I'm going to willingly subject myself to Satan or the world, you've taken the mark of the beast then, right? And anytime you've not been able to do business because you weren't willing to bend the knee to idolatry or worship of other things, then there's what happens, right? When you won't take the mark of the beast. Now, will it get worse as closer to Jesus comes back? Probably. Um, even the idea of the Antichrist, and I know this is all over the place, but... Um, um, you can bear with me. The idea of an antichrist and there's this literal one person figure, right? And people were all freaking out. Oh, Obama's the antichrist or Oprah's the antichrist or blah, 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 blah. But if you read 1 John 2, it says this. This is really interesting. Children, it's the last hour. And as you have heard that antichrist is coming, so now many antichrists have come. Isn't that interesting? Therefore, we know that it's the last hour. And then er later on in, in verse... Um, uh, verse 22, he says, Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. So John, John writes in 1 John, he says, there's been lots of Antichrists. Anyone who denies that, that, that Jesus is the Christ or denies the Father and the Son, they're an Antichrist. <laughs> so I think we have this idea largely based upon the Left Behind series and kind of dispensational theology that one day soon, it hasn't happened yet, there's going to be this one person that rises up as the Antichrist. I'm not 100% convinced that that's true. I think there have been man many Antichrists. People who willingly uh, rise up and oppose Jesus um, and set up their own kind of kingdom that is opposite to the kingdom of Jesus. That would be the antithesis, right? The anti-Christ. So you think about world history, there have been lots of people like that, right? Was Hitler an antichrist? Probably, right? There's been, there's been lots of people like that who have denied Jesus, denied God, set up their own kingdom, and attempted to blind people to the truth of the gospel. Lots of antichrists have existed. So anyways, um, Joni says, is there scripture reference for Mark as God's child? Um, it says in, uh, in, the, in Revelation 7, it talks about the fact that God seals, right, his people. Um, 
and they're represented by this 144,000, which I don't think is, again, literally 144,000 people. It's meant to be this symbolic number. But he says, Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God. And um, it says, um, sorry, and he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had, he had given power to harm earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees until we've sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. So that's the idea of being sealed. Um, I know, I'm just looking it up right now. Um, there we go. Because I know other verses that talk about being sealed with the Holy Spirit or the fact that the Holy Spirit is um, uh, kind of like a deposit, a marking on us kind of thing. Um, yeah, 2 Corinthians 1 says, Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God who also sealed us and gave us the Holy Spirit. So there's another... Uh, passage about God sealing his people, you know, marking them, sealing. It, it's it's meant to be the picture of, if you know, back in the day, they would have the emperor's seal, right? They would put wax, and then the emperor would put his ring in the wax and kind of seal. That was his seal. So it literally means mark. I marked, I sealed. So I would encourage you to look up different um, Bible verses about the Holy Spirit is, is our seal. So anyways, um, we could go on and on and on about Revelation. It's actually one of my favorite books of the Bible. It's very fascinating and encouraging. Um, like I've said a few times, I, I have always wanted to preach through the book of Revelation. One day we will, um, but not yet. Uh, but I think many people's view and my own view before I began to kind of dig in was just wrong about what this book is about. So um, super fascinating stuff. A book that I'll recommend if you are a reader and you love to read, a great book um, on the book of Revelation is by Daryl Johnson, and it's called Discipleship on the Edge. Um, that's, that's probably the best book I've ever read on the book of Revelation. And he just seems to present it in a way that makes sense and that kind of clears through a lot of the confusion and fear and, um, you know, wrong ideas maybe about how we've thought about it. Um, yeah. And I would encourage you to, you know, lots of people also include in their, their belief of the end times, um, Matthew, um, 24. Um, I actually preached a sermon. Oh man, you'd have to go onto the website and go back to our series in Matthew, on Matthew 24 that a lot of people said, I have never heard that before. So if you're interested, because Jesus, a lot of people look at Matthew 24 and they say, see, he's talking about the end times and it lines up with Revelation. But I, I actually don't think that Matthew 24, or at least the first half, is about the end times. So if you're interested in that, you can go on the, our website and listen to that. Joni says, well, you've given me lots to think about. Well, that's good. And again, like, dig in yourself and it's, for me, it's okay to disagree about the end times because it's not a salvation issue. I think anyone that talks about the end times, we would all agree Jesus wins and he's coming back. Okay, now let's talk about, you know, what what we have in our Bibles and what it what it's necessarily going to look like. So if you do some digging and you go, uh, I don't know about Andrew's view, that's okay. Um, that is totally fine with me. So hopefully that cleared up. Um, this person's question. I don't think we have to be really um, fearful that we're accidentally going to take the mark of the beast. Someone actually messaged me that. What if? What if I get the the COVID vaccine and it ends up being the mark of the beast and I accidentally took it? The whole point of the mark of the beast in in Revelation. Um, um, Revelation thirteen is that. Um, no one accidentally gets marked, right? It's people who are willingly deciding, I'm rejecting Jesus and I want to follow the systems and structures of the world. So again, like Christians, we freaked out when credit cards had chips in them. 
right? The little, the little, so you can tap, right? The chip. And I remember I had Christian friends that were freaking out about that. I can't get a credit card with that or a debit card because that's the mark of the beast. No, it's not, right? Because you're not going to accidentally get marked um, as a, a, a hater of Jesus. You're not going to accidentally do that. People who take the mark of the beast willingly hate Jesus. So um, I don't think that it's a vaccine. I don't think that it's a, you know, if you're a follower of Jesus and you love Jesus, I don't think you actually have to worry about accidentally taking it because that's not really what the text says. It's people who are willingly following um, the beast um, and those who are deceived by that. So um, Emily said, Ephesians 1.13, marked with the seal of the Holy Spirit. Thanks. That's another great passage. Okay, last question. So this person asked, what are some important questions for a young man in a dating relationship to ask his girlfriend? from a biblical perspective? That's a great question. Uh, and I would love um, people to comment too. Give, I don't know if this young man is watching or if, yeah, it sounds like it's a young man who asked this question, but please mark in the, in the comments, what are some good questions for a young man to ask his girlfriend from a biblical perspective? Um, now, you don't want to like um, like have a job interview on your first date, right? <laughs> Where you're like, all right, I have 25 questions based on, here's some theological questions for our first date, right? Maybe you don't do that. But I think there are some really good questions that you can ask someone, right? Um, like, who is Jesus? I think that's a fantastic question to ask someone. Because I think more and more in our day and age to ask someone like, oh, do you believe in God or are you a Christian? More and more that just means less and less, right? Because lots of people would say, sure, I believe in God. Or lots of people, even the, the title Christian, lots of people would just think, yeah, sure, I'm a Christian. Um, so I think it, a really important question to ask would be, hey, can, you know, from your point of view, who is Jesus? And see how they answer, right? Because if someone says, um, yeah, he was a really great guy. Um, you know, he taught some good things. Well, I don't know if they're necessarily a, a Christ follower. Um, ideally, you would look for someone who says, well, Jesus is the Son of God, right? And he was crucified and resurrected for um, the forgiveness of sins or whatever, right? However they word it. But I would say anyone, so here's a question, like so I think about my daughters um, and, and they're only seven and five, but one day they're going to start dating. And here are the 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 two um, things I care about. Or actually, the most important thing I care about, any guy that they bring home, who is Jesus? Do you love Jesus. I could care less how much money you make. I could care less, you know, what your job is. I could care less what you look like, right? For my daughters, that is the number one question. Do you, is Jesus your treasure? Like, do you love him? And if a guy says, yes, I love Jesus. And with every fiber of my being, I love Jesus. Okay. You're good enough for my daughter. <laughs> Um, but I mean, I, I, I need some help here. Um, as the mother of boys, I really appreciate it. Yeah, Cassie, right. I forgot you've got, th uh, three boys, right? Um, so I think first and foremost to ask someone, you know, who is Jesus? Um, who is he to you? And depending on that answer, you'll kind of know where someone is at. Um, then to even ask, you know, and it, and it could be related to that, but like, what's the most important thing in your life, right? What do you live for, right? What makes you um, excited to wake up in the morning? And ideally, right, um, all, all Christians, followers of Jesus, and, and, you know, sometimes because we're just sinful and we forget, but ideally we live for the glory of God, right? And, and maybe, um, maybe, they won't verbalize it like that, 
But I think you would want someone who says, I live, I am passionate about the glory of God, about telling people about Jesus. I want, that's, that's, that's just so important to me. That would be another one to ask. Um, another important question to ask, I think, is related to purity. And as awkward as that is, um, to ask someone, like, how important is purity to you? Like, if we're going to, if we're going to date, um, what are some boundaries that we're going to set? I think that's really important. Rather than just assuming, right? Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. We're not going to have sex till we're married. But then to actually put that on the table, and maybe not on your first date, right? Like, let's, you got to ease into it, right? You're just, oh, by the way, my name's Andrew. Um, what are your plans for purity? Maybe don't do that. Um, but I think early on to ask, you know, what are your thoughts on that? How important is that to you, right? Being pure. Um, and then if it's a serious relationship to say, okay, well, how are you and I going to pursue purity together, right? Um, that would be an important question to ask, I guess. Um, I'm trying to think from a, a, a biblical perspective um, because there's lots of questions you can ask people um, that are important to kind of hear about their upbringing and what their dad was like or what their mom was like because that affects a lot of um, what we are like, um, depending on what our parents were like. Um, but biblically speaking, um, ask them about the book of Revelation. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Don't do that. Um, but biblically speaking, you could ask them, um, um, how, how do you spend time with Jesus? I think that's a really interesting question. Because if someone says, yes, I love Jesus, okay, well, what does what does that look like for you, right? And then that kind of shows you a little bit about the the rhythms that they have in their life and what their their priorities, um, what your priorities are. Um, so I think that's a really good question to ask. Um, uh, I'm seeing that Jen. I think Jennifer's maybe watching and catching up. She says. Um, what if you're married to an unbeliever already? That's a, I want to answer that. Um, so that's back to that question about um, being unequally yoked. And Paul, Paul addresses that in 1 Corinthians 7 about if you are married to an unbeliever. Um, so he says, um, uh, he says in, verses, in verse 12, To the rest I say, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. And he doesn't mean that like you're saved because of you have a believing spouse. But he says, otherwise your children would be unclean, but as it is, they're holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother and sister... Uh, is not enslaved. God's called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? And again, Jesus saves us. He means by your example, your husband will be brought to faith. Um, and so Paul would say, you know, if you have married an unbelieving spouse and uh, you shouldn't just go divorce them. He says, no, if they consent, right? If they're okay with you being a believer, then you should stay with them and do your best to love them and follow Jesus at the same time. So, Anyways, that's that would be my answer. Any other comments about some help for some questions for this young man? Um, oh, that's a great. Are, is that, uh, Gerald? Are you saying that that's a a question to ask the person? Yeah, can we pray together? That's a great question. Oh, and so yeah, as I was saying, ask them about what their how they spend time with Jesus. Like, how, how, what does it look like in for your for your time in the Word and prayer, just walk me through what that looks like. I'm so curious to know how you grow in your own walk with Jesus. Um, I think asking uh, a girlfriend or a boyfriend as you're dating, hey, would you mind if we pray together? And to see their reaction, because ideally they would go, yes, I would love to pray with you. Um, I think that's a good thing. Uh, that's a great question to ask. Um, so those are, those are some ideas, right? Who is Jesus? What is, what is your passion in life? What do you live for? And hopefully it's connected to the glory of God. Um, how, or, or, um, how important is purity to you? And what would that look like in our relationship? 
as we pursue Jesus together? And then, yeah, um, what is your um, time with Jesus look like? And, and can we actually pray together and maybe encourage one another in that way? Those are some really good questions to ask. So that's the end of our questions. Oh, uh, Emily said, financial questions help to discern values and priorities. Yep, that's very true. To ask, you know, where do you spend your, your money? Um, that's a really good question to ask. Um, yeah, so hopefully that gives uh, whoever wrote that question some ideas for maybe questions to, to ask the person that you're interested in. That's, that's really exciting. So hopefully that's been helpful. Um, um, like I said, every Thursday now, Thursday morning, we're going to post these live Q&A videos to our YouTube account as well, just in case you want to you know, quickly go back and find um, a question that you want to re-listen to or something like that. So I know sometimes it's hard on Facebook because you have to like scroll through to get to the live Q&A. So we'll just post these on on our YouTube account every Thursday morning. So hopefully that's been helpful um, and interesting to you. And my hope is that it kind of pushes you maybe to study a little bit on your own. Um, and uh, as always, send more questions in. I love it. Uh, 778-400-4549 or you can message the, the church um, Facebook page and we can get your questions that way. And uh, we will talk to you next Wednesday.